Ladies and gentlemen, compatriots, again, I welcome you. I bring you greetings from the South Carolina Society, Sons of the American Revolution, and its 936 members, I believe it is today, located in 20 chapters throughout our state. It is an honor and privilege for both myself and my wonderful wife, Marsha. Where is my wife? There she is, my wonderful wife, Marsha. A member of the Windyall chapter of the South Carolina Daughters of the American Revolution. To be here today at this battleground site and the attending the 244th commemoration of the Battle of the Great Cambridge, a battle that took place seven months before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a harbinger of what was to become an eight year, eight years of conflict, eight years of conflict in the Revolutionary War Southern Campaign campaign against British occupation and control of the American colonies. Today we celebrate and honor the tenacity, the courage, and spirit of these brave forebears who helped carry the Patriot cause forward and whose blood gave them the greatest democratic nation the world has ever seen. And on that note, I'd like to recognize at this point in our program some distinguished guests that we have with us today. And I ask each one to stand, please. Uh, is compatriot Dan Woodruff with us? I don't know if he is. He is. Compatriot Dan Woodruff. Yes, sir. Former. Uh, S.A.R. South Atlantic District Vice President, current South Carolina Society Upstate Regional Vice President, and the South Carolina Society Color Guard Commander, Dan Woodruff, here. Uh, David Smith, where is David? I know I saw him. There he is. David. He is our uh, Society Piedmont Regional Vice President, and they do a wonderful job. I Dr. Rick Corbett, who is the Dr. Corbett, you stand. He is our SAR Vice President of Chapter Formation. Thank you. 
forcing them to sign a document promising not to take up arms again. One page of the mission was wounded. Only five or six loyalists were killed. The Thompson had to restrain his men from harming the prisoners, some of whom were sent off to Charles County in shame. Despite the Patriots' success, an unusual heavy snowstorm occurred the following day, which caused considerable suffering among the militia men who had been called to duty on short notice with inadequate clothing and without tent. Some were permanently injured by exposure and frostbite. Thereafter, the events surrounding Hainbrook became known as the Snow County. When the upcountry of South Carolina was first being settled by colonists, a man by the name of William Turner established Tony's store and noticed that that not just one. This served as a trading post between the New and the Southern Native Americans. On the one side of the large rock, the family of Tony Deacon is the pavilion today with an entrance created by the Cherokee that served as a trail marker
Fortunately for everyone here, we picked up this one for a lot more than I am. For those of you who don't know Jermaine Ashmore, he was a Greenville native, son of the well-respected surgeon who I had the pleasure of working with for many years before his retirement. Jermaine had graduated from Furman University in the late 70s and subsequently attended the University of Georgia, where he graduated with a degree from the Masters in Landscape Architecture and a graduate minor in historic preservation. And before we go on with the program, I'd like to ask y'all, please, if you have cell phones, do the silence it or turn it off. Durant is a seventh generation descendant from Walter Ashton, who was one of the original pioneers of Durant's time. He is also a descendant of the patriot Henry Durant and loyalist Colonel William Valentine. This lineage has led to his current passion for historic battlefield. In addition to his full time job in landscape architecture, he describes himself as a battlefield preservationist. He extensively studied battlefields in South Carolina, particularly those in the Revolutionary War site, and is working to clean and preserve these sites back to as close to their original state as possible. He has intensely studied the battles and the individuals involved, and his research has yielded many interesting stories which he shared with his main speaking form. Today, he will speak on the individuals involved in the Cane Break Battle. And following the program, he will lead a tour down to the battle site, which is about a mile down the property. If you are interested in viewing his email list for updates on any of his speaking, please leave your email address in the back. It is now my pleasure to welcome you to Matt Ashmore. In this 
battle. We had cousins fighting against cousins. So it was a very divided um, uh, the population there. Some folks say that half the uh, population uh, were uh, loyalists. The other half of the population was uh, patriots. Others claim that a third of the population was, was uh, loyalists, a third was patriots, and the other third just didn't care about it. But these people were um, just, they were pioneers. This was the frontier. This was the edge of civilization. So, um, you know, what side is the, do you do you choose for? There were two fronts in South Carolina, along the coast, where the aristocrats were. They were worried about the British invasion from the sea, and the British tried to invade, invade in 1776, and they were repulsed. In the back country, the uh, front, the biggest fear, was the Cherokee Indians, the relationship with the Cherokee Indians. And many times, loyalties were decided upon to the inhabitants here figured could better control the Cherokees. It was all about the Cherokees in the back country for the first five years. So um, the Patriot Council of Safety, and I appreciate John giving the um, uh, information about you know, the uh, events that occurred. And um, the Patriots wanted to curry the favor of the Cherokees, the Loyalists wanted to curry the favor of the Cherokees, the Loyalist government, the British governor got run out of Charleston, he went to a warship in Charleston Harbor, where um, he uh, remained for the next little while. And the Council of Safety in Charleston wanted to send a shipment of shot and powder to the Cherokees, so the Cherokees would be placated, and uh, wouldn't go on the world path. But that didn't exactly what happened. Also, at the same time, with the loyalist sentiment that was arriving in the back country, there was a concerted effort by the loyalists, uh, by the uh, Council of Safety in Charleston, to round up the loyalist leaders. And the primary loyalist leader at this time was a fellow named Robert Cunningham. Robert Cunningham was future general of the Loyalist militia. He was a very important man. He lived near the uh, Long Cane's Abbeville community. So Robert Cunningham was arrested and taken down to Charleston. His brother, Patrick Cunningham, was a very influential backcountry family. Uh, Robert Cunningham was the, I mean, uh, Patrick Cunningham was the richest man in what is now uh, the present day Lawrence County. He had 2,000 acre plantation. He was a justice of the peace. He was a royal justice of the peace. He was a surveyor. He was a planner. He had 40 slaves. His brother is sent to Charleston and he's in jail down there. So Patrick Cunningham um, wants to go rescue his brother, and he raises a force of about 300, 500 people. The numbers there. He raises the force, goes through 96, and is on the way to Charleston to cap to uh, rescue his brother. Well, in the meantime, he runs across the shot and powder that the Council of Safety is sending to the Cherokees, and this is at Mine Creek. 18 miles below 96. Patrick Cunningham really had no chance of rescuing his brother in So he decides he's going to do the next step thing, and he captures the wagon train that was guarded by about 25 men that was on the way to um, to the Cherokees to um, curry their faith. This set in motion an entire chain of events. Um, he had 25 men guarding the um, uh, wagon train. Patrick Cunningham has two to 500 men. He takes that um, ammunition and he's now in Scots somewhere around 96. Patriot Colonel at this time, Andrew Williamson, raises a force of 450 men. 
and he is in opposition to Patrick Cunningham. <coughs> Joseph Robinson, a loyalist militiaman from the Camden area, raises a force of 1,800 men. <coughs> and he surrounds Andrew Williamson's 450 men in 96. This is the first siege of 96. And this is where the first Patriot sat there and lost his life, James Green, and died in the first siege of 96. Well, the Council of Safety in Charleston is not going to put up with 1,500 loyalist militiamen besieging Andrew Williamson in 96. So they raised a force of 4,000 men under the command of Colonel Richard Richardson, who was a Camden militia. Richard Richardson was 71 years old. And he starts moving into the back country of South Carolina. He is joined by 750 militiamen from North Carolina. And these men group together at Hollingsworth Mill, which is down in present day Lawrence County. 45,000 men, the largest army that has ever been in South Carolina, this side of Columbia. There were not 4,000 men at Calp Inns. There were not 4,000 men at Kings Mountain. In 1775, under uh, Colonel Richard Richardson at Hollingworth Mill, about 25 miles from here, there was a 4,000 man army. The siege was broken. Patrick Cunningham and 200 men knew that there was a force coming to get them. So what did they do? They go to the wildest, most possibly um, safest place they could possibly imagine, where they couldn't be attacked. And that was in the middle of a cane break on the Reedy River, which again is one mile down that way. Cane breaks were traditionally uh, defensive uh, fortifications or structures or areas for the Cherokees. When you were in the middle of a cane break, nobody could sneak up on you. It was a safe place. The rustling leaves made too much noise. So you knew your enemy was coming after you if you were in the middle of the cane break. And the snow fell for the next 30 years. 
those are important loyalist food policies. Numerous important patriots are here. Talked about Major Thompson leading the 1,300-man flying force down in East Miami. He was in command of the activities here. Six months later, he's in Charleston. He's on uh, Sullivan's Island. June 28, 1776, this is Carolina Day, this was when the British warships attacked uh, Sullivan's Island, the Battle of Sullivan's Island. Uh, Danger Thompson's duty, his job, his assignment was to guard the north end of Sullivan's Island at Reach Inlet, which is an inlet between um, Isle of Calm and Sullivan Island. The British had information that if they landed uh, their 2,200-man two, uh, uh, army on the north end of the of uh, Isle of Palms, they could march down Isle of Palms, cross Breach Inlet, and attack Sullivan's, uh, the fort on Sullivan's Island from the land. And if they had done that, we would be speaking English today. <laughs> But uh, Danger Thompson, with his 700 men, held off the British Army, 2,200 men. Of course, they did have a little bit of help from Breach Inlet, because uh, the British information was that Breach Inlet was only 315. And all of us know Breach Inlet is much deeper than that. And uh, tremendous rip currents through the Inlet. So all they were able to do was just fire cannons back and forth. That was uh, Major Thompson, who fought here. A week later, he joined up with General uh, Williamson again in 96, and he participates in the uh, Second Cherokee War, the Cherokee War of 1776. Major accomplishments there. So other patriots who fought here happened to be are one and only Colonel Robert Anderson. The Colonel Robert Anderson chapter is named after Robert Anderson, who was uh, second in demand to General Andrew Pickens throughout the entire war. The city of Anderson, the county of Anderson, is named after Robert Anderson. At this point, he was a captain. He fought here. Uh, Thomas Sumter was the adjutant to Colonel Richardson second in command. Now, he was part of Richardson's force, but we don't think he participated here. We're pretty sure he didn't participate here. Andrew Pickens was part of Colonel Richardson's force, and we don't think he participated here either. Um, but other colonels, future colonels in the revolution were very important here. Now, South Carolina has a very proud distinction to know that the three most important, courageous, greatest um, militia generals came from our state. This is Francis Marion, Thomas Sumter, and Andrew Pitches. We have the utmost respect and pride in our own but they couldn't have done their job without the colonel. And the South Carolina militia colonels were some of the fighters men that, uh, you know, fought throughout the entire revolution. And I'll tell you this about South Carolina's role in the revolution. We know that there were at least 200 engagements in South Carolina. And depending on how you count it, some you can say 400 more so than any other state in the Union can uh, combine. And from where we're standing right here, within 50 miles of this one spot, there were 112 Revolutionary War engagements. 112. No place in America can make that claim. Spartanburg County had more uh, Revolutionary War battles than any other county. Lauren is second. 
So uh, we have we have a uh, unique pair of that we should be proud of. But South Carolina <coughs> colonels, future colonels who fought here, um, it was uh, Thomas Neal, um, John Thomas Sr., John Thomas Jr., um, Andrew Hampton, uh, Wade Hampton's great uncle. All of these men fought here. Thomas Neal, from the new acquisition, uh, he raided Richard Paris's plantation with John Thomas Sr. from the Spartan Regiment. They both raided uh, Richard Paris's plantation. They burned it to the ground. This is July 15, 1776, on the day that James Lindley and uh, David Fanning left Paris Plantation to go attack Fort Lindley. Thomas and Neil attacked Paris's plantation and burned it to the ground. Thomas Neil was killed at the Battle of Stonewall uh, when the British were attacking in May, and this was in April of 1780. He had twin sons who were colonels, and they fought the sons. Both of his twin sons were killed in battle. He had a third son that was killed. He had a fourth son that was at Hayes Station in 1781 who was brutally murdered by Bloody Bill Cunningham. So that's the sacrifices that the Neal family made. They lost the men of that family, the daughters. And actually, I think there were some younger sons who survived. I had their um, descendants come from my talk. John Thomas Sr., his wife Jane, was murdered and scouted by the Cherokees. He was captured uh, in Charleston Bell. Colonel Richard Richardson was captured in Charleston Bell. Major Danger Thompson was captured in Charleston Bell. I told you that uh, when uh, Richard Richardson was here, he was uh, 71 years old. When he was at the age of 76, he was captured in Charleston. He suffered seriously, he had um, uh, serious illnesses. He was finally released by the British authorities to go back home and he died a month later. Maybe due to the treatment he had as a British POW, maybe due to old age, you know. Um, William Thompson was later exchanged in a prisoner squad, and uh, he wound up fighting with uh, Nathaniel Green in, in a future battle. Um, so these are some of the men that fought here had really important roles in the entire future of the uh, Revolutionary War. There was one Patriot casualty in this battle, and he was a fellow named William Polk. He was a lieutenant that came down from uh, North Carolina to join with Colonel Richardson. Lieutenant William Polk was 17 years old, and he, he was a lieutenant. Um, many young people, we have 16-year-old babies that fought and, uh, and did well. William Chronicle was a patriot here at the age of 20. William Chronicle was killed leading a charge at King's Mount. He was one of the 25 casualties at King's Mount. So just hero after hero in future Revolutionary War battles participated here. And that brings us to a fellow who did participate here as a patriot. A patriot who fought against his cousin. A patriot who fought against his cousin, Patrick Cunningham. And that leads us to the patriot, William Cunningham, who fought here against his cousin. William Cunningham joined the uh, uh, Long Cane's militia, and 
he said when he joined that he was promised to be promoted to lieutenant and he was promised never to have to be further than 50 miles from his home. Well, his regiment was transferred to Charleston and he didn't like it. And he was not promoted to lieutenant and he didn't like that either. So he started becoming insubordinate and his regimental commander had enough of that he tied him to a post and publicly whipped him with 50 lashes for insubordination. And women coming here really didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he deserved it. And he went down to East Florida. And when uh, the British captured Savannah in 1778, he wound up back in Savannah. So there were bad guys on the uh, loyalist side. There were some really bad guys. And there were some bad guys on the Patriots. But one of the bad Patriots was a guy named uh, Captain Ritchie. And Captain Ritchie went to William Cunningham's home place, where uh, Cunningham's father and intimate brother were. And Ritchie plundered Cunningham's coat place. He abused the father. He killed the infamous brother. And when William Cunningham got this news in Savannah, he walked 180 miles in six days and went straight to Captain Ritchie's home place. Because these people all knew each other. They were neighbors. He dragged uh, Captain Ritchie out by the scruff of his neck, threw him down in the front yard of his home. Wife and children come out the door, they see what's happening, and William Cunningham shoots uh, Captain Ritchie in the right in his front yard. William Cunningham is a fellow who later got famous under the name of Bloody Bill Cunningham. He's the most infamous South Carolinian ever to exist. And he fought here. He fought here as a patriot. Later, when British had lost every battle in South Carolina and they were holed up in Charleston. This is a month after the Georgetown. Georgetown was in uh, October of 1781. We think that the battles stopped when Georgetown fell. Well, the British who were still ensconced in uh, Charleston, they weren't through fighting. And they sent uh, Bloody Bill Cunningham and 300 men on a murderous rampage throughout the state of South Carolina. And this is referred to as the Bloody Scout. So they uh, left in a place called Clouds Creek near Orangeburg. They came upon 27 Patriots, um, camped, unsuspecting anybody that's come upon them and those 27 men were slaughtered. About two weeks after that, they come to Hay Station in Lawrence County, 30 miles from here. Um, again, the 300 men surrounded the 25 or so that were at Hay Station. They uh, set the blockhouse on fire where the men were uh, uh, holed up. So the men surrendered, they came out one at a time, had their hands tied behind their backs, and they were promised that they would be treated as prisoners of war as soon as the last man had his hands tied behind his back. They started to hang them one after another, except that when they hung the first, started to hang the first two off of the fodder pole, the pole broke. And Bloody Bill Cunningham was so mad at that, that he pulled out his sword and he started hacking and chopping. And he killed 18 men there, cut them to absolute pieces. This is 35 miles from where we are right now, 1781, um, at uh, the massacre at Hayes Station. One of the most gruesome massacres that occurred during the Revolutionary War happened just over here in Lawrence County. Uh, Cunningham made a 30-day journey circuit through, through the state of South Carolina, killing as he went. He killed 76 men. 
And so that man was here. Uh, what's the rest of the story? Um, Patrick Cunningham, who was the commander here, who was elected to the state house of the representatives, uh, he left and went to Jamaica, but he applied to be re-established in Lawrence County. And he was allowed to do so. He, uh, he was fined or immersed 12% of his uh, work. And then he came and he became a very successful planner uh, in Lawrence County from there on out. His granddaughter, by the way, and Pamela Cunningham is responsible for preserving Mount Vernon. She started the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and they raised $200,000 to buy Mount Vernon for the Washington descendants. It was in total disrepair. It was the first historic preservation project in the United States. And in fact, Patrick Cunningham's granddaughter, who, who does that. Robert Cunningham, the loyalist general, he goes to the Bahamas uh, and he's given a pension for the rest of his life by the British government for his losses here around Hollywood. Bloody Bill Cunningham, the most hated man in South Carolina, maybe the most hated man in America, he winds up with his cousin Robert in the Bahamas. And he lived there for six years. And he died under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> two, two reasons given. One is that um, he uh, he was poisoned, and then the other reason that he died he died from syphilis. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that's that's the battle of the King's Lake. It had a profound effect. The loyalist leaders were arrested or went out of the country. Um, so the, the loyalists lost their leadership, and it led to a period of five years of peace. For two and a half years, there was just no fighting at all. Uh, Thomas Sumter was so bored that he retired because there was no fighting. But uh, when the British captured uh, Charles in May 12, 1708, that changed things. And this is really the time that the Patriots are uh, banded together and, and just absolutely threw off the yoke of British oppression because the British was very oppressive when they um, uh, overtook uh, the state of South Carolina. Now, um, you know, uh, there was a brief mention that I do battlefield preservation work, and uh, uh, that's really my uh, passion. I've been doing work here at the Battle of the King Brave, which is one of my, I guess this may have been the first um, site that I started working on. I'm also doing quite a bit of work at Fort Medley, which I mentioned, fascinating place, and quite a bit of work at Hayes Station, which is another. Hay Station is the most sacred spot in Lawrence County. Other than the churches, Hay Station is the most sacred spot because those men really sacrificed in the But for those of you who are interested, we're going to have a tour of the battlefields later on. Now, I will tell you that it's muddy down there, and that's boots and blue jeans um, a hike. And how we get down there is going to be uh, significant as well because you kind of need a high clearance vehicle to do that. But we've got we can make arrangements where we can ferry folks down. Um, or there's about a quarter mile hike that's in the Does anybody have any questions? Uh, questions that didn't get covered? If not, then I appreciate your attention. Yes. Yes. Yes, well, I just went across that um, peripherally, I guess you could say. There was a Presbyterian minister who, who definitely was a uh, fighting. I, I, I know that there was a Presbyterian minister who, who uh, um, 
Well, now, I will tell you this, though. Andrew Pickens, now see, uh, the Presbyterians, you had to be college educated to be a Presbyterian minister. If you weren't, you couldn't be a minister. But Andrew Pickens was very religious, and he moved four times in the state of South Carolina, from White Sauce to Abbeville, to uh, the Clemson campus, um, and then to the Red House in the Boston. Everywhere that Andrew Pickens went, he founded a, or helped to found a Presbyterian church. And his best friend, Robert Anderson, who was his second in command all this time, was also the deacon in the Presbyterian church. Um, but there wasn't a big religious movement so, so um, one of the authors, I think it may have been great, or says that uh, of the religious folks, half of them were um, uh, Presbyterian, the other half were Baptist, but that 90% of the population was unchurched. So, uh, that's the information I have. Just up, just up. Well, I thank you for your attention. And uh love to have you join us on the battlefield tour a little bit later on. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, if you would like to get on the ranch mailing list, if you would use your email address and back at the signing table, I'll make sure that he gets those. And now we come to the Solemn part of our program, the presentation of uh, Memorial Reads. Yeah, I did. Yeah. For the presentation of the first read, I would like to present South Carolina State essay of our president, Matt Smith. Sons of the Revolution, uh, Tom Widener and Al Dutrell. years when these pecans are totally grown, they're, they're still in alley of, uh, of pecans here. We do not know if this is where the site was. Now this is where the Hopkins family has recognized the site as being since 1876. And, you know, the verbal um, information that passed down through the generations, I mean, it just gets lost. So this is the earliest verbal information that, that we know. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I mean, I, I could have talked about twice as many names as I talked about and twice as many activities as what those guys did. But one of the officers who was here was Richard Wynn. And the name of uh, the town of Winsboro is named after his family. He was, he was a pretty darn good colonel. He, he fought under um, Sumter, and he was in a lot of battles. But again, he was here. 
And in 1785, he, he bought 640 acres here um, that is the site of the Battle of the Cambrai, one square mile. And the, the surveys back then, there were really no points of reference. It's like there's a lot of like a lot of that happened at Due West, South Carolina, which then was called DeWitt's Corner. It was the westernmost point that was surveyed at DeWitt's Corner. So since they knew where that was, a lot of stuff happened at DeWitt's Corner. The southern border of Greenville County, for instance, but that's another story. Um, but on the plat of Richard Wynn from 1785, the Reedy River is shown. And it's shown with the curves of the Reedy River. And the Reedy, the Reedy is just right over there. You know, we could, we could throw a rock and hit it from, from here. So when you match up the current course of the Reedy and what's on Richard Wynn's um, plot, you can you could see, and the, the bottom third of that acre, I mean that area, is right here. And on that plot, there's a big, you know, circle drawn, and it says cane break. So this, this was part of it if it wasn't it. Uh, Richard Wynn only owned this property for two years. And then he sold it to a fellow named, another veteran from this battle named Samuel Harrison. And Samuel Harrison built his house on the other side of the river over there. Um, and the Harrison family, well actually, where's Jake? Oh, okay. You want to tell us? about your interest and so forth? Oh, uh, well, I mean, we're the, pretty much, where they said, it would be about half a mile now, I guess, is where a lot of the canes were. But, uh, you know, it, it, wherever it happens, there were people running through all this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jay grew up on the Battle of Cambridge. He grew up on the other side of the river over there. So there's kind of three parcels, if you will, that um, you know could have been the cane break. This is one of them. Samuel Harrison's house is right over there. Where Jake grew up was right over there, straight across the river from us. How many yeah. acres did y'all have? One forty. So yeah, right on. If you walk on the other side of that river is where our farm yeah. was. Yeah. Of course, now they sold it to a bunch of British people. <laughs> 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 And but that's where part of original, where the problem comes in. Where was the original Harrison house located? <laughs> didn't, it, it, didn't it on South Harrison Bridge Road? Didn't it that big white frame frame house? Well, that was about Haynes. There. Maybe the Haynes. Uh, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Barry Haynes, right. Well, to see where our farm was, um, was also a big giant, say a small mansion back in the day. It got burnt down twice. That, that may have been connected to it as well. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can, this is, this is how the stories go. Um, but in any case, uh, and as Jake referred to, this was probably a running battle anyway. I mean, you know, if you got 70 men chasing, and they definitely went that way, and you got 1,300 men chasing them, you know, you've got several miles of, uh, of battle. <laughs> but it's very easy to illustrate what happened at the battle from this site. And during colonial times, this would have been totally overgrown in a uh, giant river cane, the only American bamboo, the London area Gigantia. And it was about uh, 15, 20 feet tall. Thick, thick. Mm. Uh, Cane was one of the most valuable plants of all to the Indians. They built their houses out of it. You know, they would, they would make a lath structure and then they would uh, cover it with uh, uh, straw um, and, uh, and mud. Waddle and dog construction is what they had. But they used it for so many things. You could make a spear out of it. And uh, you could gig frogs or whatever. You could make a blowgun out of river cane. And they would use those blowguns to wound small animals like squirrels and rabbits, and then they would, you know, dispatch them from there. Um, make baskets out of it, fish traps. Um, there is another kind of cane, smaller cane. Some people call it rich cane. 
switch cane or hill cane, and that you can really weave and make baskets out of. So cane was very valuable to the, um, to the Cherokees. And the, the, the pioneers, when they started coming through the, um, uh, the entire southeast, and there was hundreds of thousands of acres of, uh, of uh, bottomland that was in river cane. The Reedy River is named the Reedy River because of river cane. And um, the Indians really didn't like it so much because it really, the rivers were the water were the uh, uh, courses and it was so thick in cane. But this would have been, you know, just totally surrounded in, in tall river cane. Why is all the cane gone? Okay, um, so them. here's the thing. Well, yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of it on the other side. Mm -hmm. River cane is in the grass family. Corn is in the grass camp family. Early pioneers realized really quick that everywhere that cane grew, corn would grow. So it was all plowed under, okay? It was burned off, plowed under, and, and all of that. Did they grow any cotton around here? Yes, they grew a lot of cotton, but you wouldn't grow it in the bottom lands because no. it would have been too right. wet. But all of the, all of Hopkins Farm was planted in cotton. This was Cotton Kingdom uh, back then, uh, no, no doubt about it. So um, you can imagine what happened here on the morning of December 22nd, 1775, when it's bitter, bitter cold. And you've got 200 men camped here around their fires, you know, trying to catch, you know, just a few hours of, of sleep in that, in that bitter cold. Well, in the meantime, the, the one description we have of the battle comes from Colonel Richard Richardson in his report to the Council of Safety in, in Charleston. And uh, what he says is that uh, Colonel Thompson, Danger Thompson, and by the way, we have two descendants of uh, Colonel Thompson here, uh, Edwin Haspel, who I went to, grew up with, and uh, Larry. 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 Oh, and, and you're there, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, 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 of course. So y'all are cousins. Yeah, they just, just met each other. I right, appreciate y'all being here, certainly do. Um, but Colonel Richardson describes uh, uh, Colonel Thompson's men going through the surrounding hill, okay, and uh, trying to uh, surround the men who were camped here. And shots rang out, the alarm was given, um, Patrick Cunningham jumps on his horse and says every man shift for himself, and 70 men, including uh, David Fanning, um, <coughs> take off here. And for those of y'all who don't know, I'd like to introduce Joe Epley, who has written a book about David Fanning. It's a fascinating book. It's called A Passel of Trouble. I highly recommend that you, that you read that book, and you're obviously interested in uh, Revolutionary War history. David Fanning wrote an autobiography in like 1790 or something like that. And, um, so uh, Joe has taken the information in that autobiography and uh, expanded and made a historical fiction book that's fascinating to read. And uh, Joe gives lectures on uh, David Fanning, and we could talk for hours about David Fanning. Uh, 19-year-old kid here, who, and he's the one that led a 900-man regiment here in North Carolina. Um, he was thought of so highly by the British that they gave him his own coat, a red coat with black lapels. And, you know, people were stealing clothes just because clothes were so rare back then. And so here's David Fanning, he's got his own special coat. But anyway, um, so you know, that's that's what happened here. The um, uh, uh, Tories were camped somewhere around here. They got surrounded and, and they uh, skedaddled into the mountains or into the wilds of the Indian Territory, the wildest place they would get. Now, one fellow that I briefly touched on during my talk earlier was James Lindley, who was a captain here. He was a captain here with uh, Patrick Cunningham. He was also a justice of the peace, as Captain Cunningham was, and he lived maybe 10 miles from where Captain Cunningham lived.
So he was one of the ones that got captured here. And he got captured, hands behind his back, walked down to Charleston in two feet of snow over a two-week journey. And uh, that was in December. In April, he was let go. He signed his parole and um, was let go. He comes back. His, his house, which had a fort on it, was taken over by the Little River Militia, and he couldn't go there. So he goes up and he stays, hangs out with Richard Paris and them up at uh, where the Liberty Bridge is in Greenville. I told you a little bit about the story. He and David Fanning banded together. They got one account says 300 Tories and 300 or 300 Cherokees and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokees marched to Fort Lindley. They would have come right through here down to Fort Lindley in Lawrence County and there they attacked the Patriot forces which just happened to be about 600 strong at the same time. We know exactly where Fort Lindley is. It's one of the few places we know where it was and the reason we know that is because if you look and you realize that you are on the site of a Revolutionary War fort, the trenches are still visible there. The trenches at that point would have been 10 mm. feet wide and 6 feet deep. Now they're 2 feet wide and 1 feet deep, but you can see, you can see what happened there. So he attacked his fort. Um, there was a shootout. The attack was broken. The Cherokees and the Tories skedaddled. Uh, Captain Lindley's horse was left behind and in his saddlebags they found his commission papers. We don't know what he did for the next 18 months. He was hanging out somewhere up here in Cherokee territory. Uh, 1778 comes, the British take Savannah. There's a resurgence of loyalist activity. Um, uh, James Lindley winds up with a fellow named uh, John Boyd, I believe a loyalist leader. And there down in Georgia, trying to hook up with the Cherokee, with the uh, British in Augusta, who have taken Augusta by that time. Well, Andrew Pickens knew about this loyalist force that was coming in, so he, he gathers a band. He had 200 men, the loyalists had 600. But the loyalists were, um, had, were demoralized. And Pickens, with his 200 men, defeats those 600 men at the Battle of Kettle Creek which is not too far from Augusta. Uh, and at that point, Captain James Lindley is captured again for the second time. So remember, he, uh, he signs his parole down in Charleston. Now, a couple of years afterwards, he's captured again. Well, that's a big no-no if you sign your parole. So he's sent to um, 96, and he's put on trial there with about four or five other folks who apparently had broken their parole too. And uh, those guys were hung by the neck. And uh, now they're buried somewhere around around 96. So, you know, that's that's the story on uh, on James Lindley. Yes. I didn't, I didn't want to answer her sentence. I didn't know, but I just emailed my dad. That was the original Harrison State. It broke down twice. Good, good, good. Thank the you. Second time was in the 50s. Uh huh. And they just never rebuilt it again. Right. But Bob Harrison was a descendant. His, his grandfather, probably like the mid 90s, something real old, early 90s. I guess his grandfather or great grandfather was the original Harrison. Right, right. His, his name was Samuel. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's, that's me. Now, uh, I told you that Richard Wynn had uh, this one square mile area for two years and then he sold it to Samuel Harrison. Well, the price of that sale was one black horse. <laughs> <laughs> so he sold a square mile right here for one horse. One other interesting thing about Lindley is that he was a Quaker. He was a Quaker, right. Nathaniel Green was a Quaker. But um, he was, Lindley was a fighting Quaker. Uh, and, well, there's just so many tie-ins here. Been, uh, there, there is a Lindley's Mill now on the Hall River in North Carolina that has been in operation um, ever since the Revolutionary War. In the Lindley family. In the Lindley family. It's still called Lindley's I think they make pizza dough for 
Papa John's wow. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, they've been in continuous operation all this time. But when David Fanning was um, kidnapping the governor of North Carolina, he came through that area, and, and one of his significant fights was at Lindley's Mill in North Carolina. So, I mean, it's just... I, I read these. I just realized yesterday, I think, that Colonel Robert Anderson, and I've been speaking to the Colonel Robert Anderson chapter of the uh, SAR. Does anybody members here the Robert Anderson chapter? Um, but all this time, and, and they didn't know it. They didn't know that the chapter name that they were named after fought here. And they found out today. Um, but it's... Uh, the associations are just uh, so, striking. So Lindley was hung at 96. Yeah. He's in an unmarked grave. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I have Lindley descendant. See, and his son uh, was a patriot. Yeah, one so, son who was with, yeah. with uh, Fanny Noble. Yeah, that right. Bill Lindley. Right. Uh, so I have Lindley descendants contact me who want to go see Fort Lindley. I have um, people contact me who... Uh, had their ancestors butchered at Hayes Mill, at Hayes uh, Station. Um, and one thing, I, t I talked about Thomas Neal and how he had, you know, lost all his family during the Revolutionary War. You know, Bloody Bill Cunningham fights here. Later on, Bloody Bill Cunningham slaughters, and I think this kid was like 16 years old at, uh, at Hayes Station. So, um, I mean, he just he just chopped into pieces. Yeah, two of Williams, Colonel uh, Colonel Williams' son. Two of yeah. Colonel Williams' son. I mean, this is at, at James Williams was an ardent uh, patriot in uh, the Little River District, is what Lawrence County was called at that time. James Williams was the leading patriot, if you will, and he ran for the state senate in 1778 against Robert Cunningham, the Tory general, and Robert Cunningham won. <laughs> but uh, Williams was uh, instrumental in the Battle of uh, Musgrove's Mill. He did a great job there. Uh, he was, but he, he got sideways with Sumter's men. That's another story. But um, he was killed at uh, King's Mountain, one of the last casualties there. But Hayes Station, is about two miles from where Williams' home place is. And during Hay Station, when Bloody Bill came through, he had um, his son Daniel Williams was a 19-year-old lieutenant, second in command. And Daniel Williams and uh, uh, Joseph Hayes were to be hung at the same time. And there's two stories about how this goes, but then the, the younger Williams boy, who was 14, is supposedly says, uh, oh brother, oh brother, what shall I tell our mother? The father had been killed a few months ago. The older brother is about to get hung by the neck. And uh, he says, oh brother, oh brother, what shall I tell our mother? And Bully Bill turns to the kid and says, you'll tell her nothing, you damn rebel suckling. And he stabs him through right there. Now, if that story is true, the 14-year-old boy was the um, first one killed at Hay Station. Another story says that uh, um, uh, um, Joseph Hayes and Daniel Williams are dead. They were the first two killed. And the young boy goes up to Captain Cunningham. And he says, Captain Cunningham, what shall I tell our mother? And at that point, Cunningham looks at him and says, you'll tell her nothing. And he killed, killed him then. But, I mean, it was just a brutal murder. And, mm -hmm. I mean, Bloody Bill Cunningham was an absolute psychopathic murderer. What year was that place? Uh, 1781, November 19, 1781. This was a month after Yorktown. I fought him, too. I fought too. Um, but and the Patriots had killed his family. Uh, William Ritchie had, yes. Yes. And you can make an argument that everything Bloody Bill Cunningham did was retribution mm -hmm. for past offenses. I'd have felt the same way. As he you may very well have. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Yeah. All right, so Joseph Hayes, who was the 
uh, colonel of the Little River Regiment. He uh, and he was just you know brutally murdered, but two months before Cowpens, he was with Colonel William Washington, George Washington's second cousin. They were hanging around Cowpens, and they got word that Georgia militia was coming up to join Tarleton. So uh, when they get that word, William Washington takes off with his cavalry and he brings the local commander, which is Joseph Hayes, with him. So you have William Washington and uh, the infantry of uh, Joseph Hayes marching down to where the uh, Tories from Georgia are. I think it, uh, I think it's about a hundred of them. And uh, there, the Tories are at Hammond Store in uh, Lawrence County, which is 10 miles from Hayes Station. Everybody knew everything that was going on. The Tories were eating lunch. They had their weapons stacked. William Washington got at the top of the hill. He saw uh, the Tories camped out at Hammond store. He charges. He just immediately charges. William Washington was a very hard charging guy. So he goes through there and they never fired a shot. And he's hacking and slashing as he goes through. And then when he does that, goes through the camp, he turns around, he comes back through, and he hacks and slashes again. And there were a hundred uh, uh, loyalist casualties at Hammond store. There were zero Patriot casualties at Hammond store. So is Hammond store a uh, bloody um, massacre that occurred um, by Patriot forces? Many folks would say yes. And um, Bloody Bill's compatriots would say, yes, we've got to avenge Hammond store, go to Joseph Hayes plantation and kill anybody there that you find. Mm -hmm. Of course, now the way he killed them, I mean, he chopped them in so many pieces, they couldn't tell whose head belonged to whose hands and, and, and the rest of it. Um, the families of four of the men were able to collect the body parts and they took them and, and, buried, and buried them. But 14 of those men were buried in two common graves and we don't know where those graves are. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What time of day did this... Dawn. Dawn. This happened at dawn and it was a 15 minute battle. And as soon as it was over, it started snowing. Hmm. It probably happened just before dawn and it was still dark. Yeah. That's why yeah. Fanning got away, yeah. I assume, right. uh, from his area. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Do you think that they were people that were here at the camp? Right? What kind of fire that was making the crackling noise? They yeah. couldn't hear them sneak around them? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when River King uh, <coughs> uh, burns, it pops like rifle shots. I don't think they were as loud as those muskets we heard. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. How many acres are still here in the Hopkins? 500. And, and it I was 2,000. Something like that, yeah. yeah we, it was hundreds of acres. <coughs> There's a slave graveyard here. Is this trust land now, or is this privately held? I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Well, um, the just, daughter and husband were, were here a minute ago. Yeah, they just yeah, left they off just... the little golf cart. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And if the British caught you and you signed that paper, they'd do the same thing to you, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. That's what happened to Isaac Hayne. Uh, he said that he would not uh, take up arms again. Uh, but his wife got smallpox, so he had to go into Charleston to get medicine. He had permission to get medicine, and uh, when he did, you know, they they arrested him and, and hung him. Oh. No, that was when he got got take, uh, signed the uh, pardon, pardon. When, when, when he went in for medicine. That he was captured. Actually, he captured Williamson, uh, and. Uh, and the British turned, came in and uh, captured him. Okay. The only really a, uh, battle he was involved in. Thank you. For, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I visited his grave in Coffin County. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've got iron fence around his knee. They told me the story of that. Time. Well, there was a. Um, this was, you know, a tragedy. You know, should not have, should not have killed, hung Isaac Haynes. And there was even a uh, debate in Parliament about how horrible it is that British soldiers are hanging innocent people or whatever. 
So then, um, 300 officers that were in um, uh, Charleston signed a paper saying, hey, okay, Haynes got, got hung. But there's all these other people that that the British hung. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's no, it's justified. It wasn't ever so. 300 officers signed that piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, one name that jumped out to me, big time, was uh, Colonel William Ballantyne. And hmm, started thinking, my mother's maiden name is Ballantyne. Colonel William Ballantyne was my um, uh, fifth great grandfather, and he was a loyalist uh, uh, captain and uh, later colonel. Um, he fought at Musgrove's Mill. He lost at Musgrove's Mill. He fought at Kings Mountain. He lost at Kings Mountain. He was he was captured at Kings Mountain. And in Kings Mountain, they, they uh, sentenced 34 of the uh, Loyalist officers to be hung. He was a Loyalist officer. Whether he was one of the 34 or not, I don't know. Nine of those officers were hung before they got tired of hanging people. And they, you know, stopped, stopped doing them. And they were marching them up through North Carolina, uh, up to Virginia. And... Uh, Captain Ballantyne escaped during that march, and he got back with the British forces, and then he was sent to 96, that was then surrounded by Nathaniel Green, and for 28 days he was besieged at 98, at uh, 96, by people who had just captured him at King's Mountain and sentenced him to death. But the relief column from Charleston came through, and the siege was broken, and he led a refugee retreat into Charleston. There were few casualties at the siege of 96. On the retreat from 96 to Charleston, 50 men died from heat stroke. I mean, it was, it was brutal back then. And, and that's why William Ballantyne wound up in, in Charleston. But uh, I'm descended from a Tory captain, or colonel, actually. Uh, William Ballantyne lost every battle he ever fought in. William Ballantyne was promoted after every battle he was in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may have been attrition, you know. Well, after the war, what happened to William Ballantyne? I, I appreciate you asking. Uh, and this is really what I'm most proud about him. Three years after the war, he came back to his his land. It, the town of Ballantyne, South Carolina, is named that. Oh. And I went by that sign a thousand times saying, look. Oh, you know, my mother spelled her name with just one L, and William, the town of Ballantyne has two L's. We found out later that when William Ballantyne's grandfather, or grandson, moved to Lawrence County, he got the L out of Newberry. They <laughs> 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 really care so much about spelling. Yeah, I know, no, they do. And I, 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 I fought at the, uh, John Ballantyne had six sons who fought as privates in the, um, uh, uh, war between states and the name Valentine is spelled 44 different ways. <laughs> but anyway, um, three years after the war and he returned to his home site, um, he was elected road commissioner for Newberry County. And that tells me that he fought with honor. I'm proud of that. Um, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't run off. You know, many of these people were run off. They weren't allowed to come back home. Uh, they didn't confiscate his land. <laughs> did not confiscate his land. Um, he was born in Ireland at the age of two. His family moved to Scotland, lived there for 20 years. At the age of 22, he comes to America. And for any adult who comes to America at that time, they're automatically granted 100 acres of land. So they were dirt poor farmers, tenant farmers in Ireland and Scotland. All of a sudden, he comes to the Dutch Fork area of South Carolina, and he's got 100 acres. He's a rich man at the age of 22. Who are you going to give your allegiance to? He was a loyalist. Um, that 100 acres wasn't worth maybe a half a mule. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have been, yeah. 
Um, land, two, land two, was three. Two, yeah. Two, <laughs> two rows were the original. Two. This is it. This one and this one. Yeah. Okay. But they, but they were 30 of them. 30. Um, and you can see where a couple of them died there. I mean, this this one piece there. It's 15 in each row. But, a, but now, one thing is, um, there are, and I, I actually tagged them last year in uh, orange tape. Yeah. They're volunteer pecans that have, that have come out. Spawn. Yeah. 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 And I'll tell you this, of those pecans that we planted last year, yesterday we ate pecans off of them. So they're already bearing nuts. So, uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. Going back to the uh, uh, Cherokee trail marker that was found. Yeah. Are there images or pictures of that anywhere, or is it still around somewhere? It was in the wall at the pavilion. Oh, okay. Now, I didn't point that out. And what it is, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's a stick figure with a uh, pilgrim's hat on. Which is which is interesting, and then you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was it was put into the wall. Well, unfortunately, just about a year or two, and we think this was probably like a five-year-old kid. Somebody went up to it and just defaced it. No, mm -hmm. I, 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 it was probably not intentional, but it was after a wedding or something here, they noticed that that stone had been had been damaged. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate you doing that. You may have any other questions? Do you know where the Cherokee camp was that they were heading to? Uh, The towns, Cherokee towns, were in Oconee and Pickens County in South Carolina. There was uh, 16 of them there. This was Cherokee hunting ground. Um, there weren't any permanent Cherokee uh, settlements here, but there would have been tons of temporary ones. Um, but they did go to Richard Parrison's home place. You know, that's where the Tories were you hanging see. out. Yeah. Um, and the, the Patriots realized that. And so when that group of, uh, of uh, Tories in Cherokee left from there on July 15th, 1776, 11 days after the declaration was signed, marched down to Fort Henry, a group from uh, the new acquisition in Spartan County possessions out of the Paris plantation uh, and they loaded them on the three wagons and they took the slaves as well. Um, they found uh, items in the Paris plantation that nobody had in the back Uh Mrs. Paris had three bonnets. What luxury. She had three petticoats. Nobody had petticoats back then. She had a harpsichord. So they, they loaded up that stuff and they took it over to Fort Prince in Spartan County, Spartanburg County, and they auctioned it off for 7,000 pounds. And I'm sure they auctioned the slaves at the same time. But the slaves were the most valuable part of uh, anywhere around. So I have looked three different times to figure out how much one pound back then was worth in dollars today. And every time I do that calculation, it comes to over a million dollars. If anybody else can calculate that, I'd be interested to see. But I've looked at different sources. I really try to research this. Yeah. Any connection with Paris Mountain? Yeah, yeah. Paris, Paris Mountain is named after Richard Pierce. Mm -hmm. Richard Pierce was an Indian trader. He had two families. He had, uh, I think Rhoda was his... Uh, um, European wife's name.
but he also had a Cherokee wife and family. He had three kids by both of them. One boy and two girls from both families. From both families, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, his uh, Cherokee son's name was George. So, um, here, it was, remember, I told you, you know, it was illegal for any person of European descent to be here unless you had a passport. Well, Paris moved to the Falls of the Vidi and started a plantation. And he had uh, a sale with like 35 chiefs that had signed deeding over. They, uh, these, um, the, the Cherokees owed him money. So he got 35 chiefs to sign a deed. And remember, he had a whiskey still, but anyway. Uh, uh, they signed over uh, 12 square miles to Richard Paris. And um, so he, he went to trial over that. He was arrested for that. He wasn't supposed to do that. And they had a trial down at 96. And somehow or another, and Joe, you may know, but somehow or another, the deed wound up in his Cherokee son's name, George. The, deed, the first deed was, was null and avoid by the, by the uh, court, by the Indian agents. And uh, he went over the, back over the mountain to get his son George and brought him back. His son George then was deeded to the land by the chiefs. Then he took his son George to uh, Charleston and got him declared an English citizen because he was his son. Yeah. And, and then when he came back, he bought uh, 50,000 acres from uh, his son, uh, George. And that happened all the time. Uh, my thesis was on... Uh, uh, my thesis was on um, uh, medicinal plants of the Cherokees. And the site that I used was the site of the Chief Van House in Spring Place, Georgia. This is uh, 1809. Um, but Chief Van was the richest uh, Cherokee chief, but he was, he would buy land, he was, uh, he would, he would buy land from the, from the Indians as an Indian and sell land as a white man to the white folk. I mean, chief, James Van had it going, coming and going. He had a thousand acre plantation with a hundred slaves. The Cherokees had black slaves. Yes, right over in that. Now there's a plaque there that says where it is. And to me, this is a piece of Greenville history that is lost. I've never heard that before. Me so that and you're a Greenville yeah. resident from, from, yeah, uh, right. yeah from forever. I don't even know the history of, of the town. That's, I when didn't that, realize it was at that site. Yeah, is that I mean, right I at knew, that site? I knew had a mill there, but I didn't yeah. know he had it. Mm -hmm. His home was right there. Yeah. The plantation there? Actually, I had two mills. You had one with a right. mill, one with a small mill. It's called Parish Plantation. Yeah, that's an old, that's, that's an, a newer mill. There's, there's really no signs. There was a huge mill there, a uh, Camperdam mill, that was torn down in the 50s. But, uh, uh, so there have been a lot of, you know, development in that site. But William Tony, who had a trading post here, uh, there was some mention in what John Sapway mentioned, and that the Hopkins family bought William Tony's place. Well, William Tony moved to, uh, at that time it was called Greenville Courthouse. And in the middle of Main Street in Greenville, which is where Court Street intersects Main Street in Greenville. You know the Poinsett Hotel, mm -hmm. the way that it's coped out, uh, you know, in a rectangle or whatever? Well, that was because the original courthouse was right in the middle of Main Street and the, the road split and went like this. William, William Tony uh, built a hotel 
on the footprint of what is now where the Poinsett Hotel was. For a hundred years, a building stood there that was called the Mansion House. And William Tony built that, installed that. And the Mansion House had a unique feature that everybody in the upstate was just fascinated with. And they would come from miles and miles just to see this, what William Tony had in his Mansion House Hotel. It was a sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, a, that was a unique feature. First couch of potato. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Folks, I can talk for hours and hours about this if you all interested in. Uh, you know, any questions you might have? No, I didn't hear what you said he had. A, it was a what? A sofa. A sofa. <laughs> that was a real feature in, in the upstate. Well, I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.